Welcome, my name is Chuck Bonham and I'm the director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you for joining this presentation, which will give an overview of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act and highlight the first time kind of unique opportunities for our department to collaborate better with tribal partners to conserve the Western Joshua Tree. Why is this important? The Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act is the very first time that the California legislature has instructed our Department of Fish and Wildlife to specifically include tribal co-management principles, incorporate traditional ecological knowledge in conservation efforts, and provides for the relocation of Western Joshua trees to tribal lands upon request from a tribe. These are essential elements for a Western Joshua tree conservation plan that we're busy developing. This plan will only work if our department heads into the future listening and learning from you who have stewarded the Western Joshua tree since the beginning of time using indigenous principles of respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. We look forward to working with you. We need your help and your guidance to help us understand the needs and the priorities around this tree from your perspective. We want to pave the way for co-management between the state of California and you as tribal sovereigns for the future of all kinds of conservation projects to benefit the Western Joshua Tree. We look forward to that collaboration. We look forward to making successful the very first time our Fish and Game Code has ever included an instruction to do co-management with you for a native species across the desert landscape. Thank you, and we look forward to the future with you. Hello, thank you for tuning into California Department of Fish and Wildlife's informational webinar on the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act intended for California Native American tribes. Topics covered in this webinar include a brief background on the biology and impacts of Joshua trees, an overview of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act, some of the various permitting systems created by the Act, the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Fund, the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Plan, and the timeline for future collaboration with California Native American tribes. Traditionally, the Joshua Tree has been a part of Native American culture, providing food, basketry, and shoe material, among other things, for tribes sharing the Joshua Tree habitat. Relatively recently, plant taxonomists have recognized two different species of Joshua trees, the Eastern Joshua Tree and the Western Joshua Tree. The easiest way you can tell them apart is by the height of their first branch. Eastern Joshua trees usually branch lower than Western Joshua trees, usually less than three feet off the ground, whereas Western Joshua trees branch higher up, somewhere between three to 10 feet off the ground. Another major factor for distinguishing the two species is their geographic location. Western Joshua trees occur from Joshua Tree National Park in the south up along the north side of the San Bernardino and San Gabriel Mountains, along the east side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, through Death Valley National Park, and into Nevada. Eastern Joshua trees occur in the eastern Mojave Desert, ranging from the Avawatt Mountains in California, east through southern Nevada and western Arizona and Utah. While Joshua trees have had a close relationship with Native Americans for thousands of years, they have an even greater one with the yucca moth. Their bond is known as a symbiotic relationship, meaning they need one another to survive. Yucca moths are the only insects that are able to pollinate Joshua trees, and yucca moths require Joshua trees in order to reproduce. Eastern Joshua trees and Western Joshua trees each have their own species of yucca moth that is only found within their respective ranges. It is only the Western species that is protected by the Act, and so efforts will mainly focus on that species and its range. However, there are many similarities between the two as far as habitat requirements go, and so what's good for one might be good for the other.
Joshua trees are especially vulnerable to climate change because they have a very specific habitat window where they can occur. They are usually found at mid-elevation sites between 2,000 and 8,000 feet throughout the Mojave. These areas receive more precipitation and are cooler than the surrounding desert. As climate change alters our global weather pattern, scientists are able to predict that this habitat window will shift northwards and higher in elevation. This will happen for most plant species. However, the main reason why Joshua trees are threatened is that they do not disperse their seeds over long distances like other plants. This is due to the loss of some of their seed dispersers, including the giant ground sloth and other large extinct plant-eating mammals. These large animals were able to reach and eat the fruit of Joshua tree high up on their branches. They would then carry them in their stomach for miles before re releasing them from their digestive system. Nowadays, the main seed disperser of these seeds are small seed caching rodents like ground squirrels and wood rats. These rodents usually travel no more than 100 feet from their home and Joshua trees take about 20 years, 20 to 40 years to reach maturity and begin producing seed. So essentially, the Joshua tree was able to migrate many miles in one generation and now can only travel about 100 feet for every 20 to 40 years. And this is why we'll see such a severe reduction in the places where Joshua trees are able to survive. Now, we're going to give a brief overview of the development of the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act and point out some key highlights. In October of 2019, the Fish and Game Commission received a petition from the Center for Biological Diversity to list the Western Joshua tree as a threatened species. In September of 2022, CDFW submitted the evaluation of the petition to the Fish and Game Commission. They determined that there was sufficient evidence to consider listing under the California Endangered Species Act, or CESA. This is when the CESA candidacy period began and protections first went into effect. In March of 2022, CDFW presented the status review of a Western Joshua Tree to the Fish and Game Commission. The status review evaluated all the current research and threats to Western Joshua Tree. It was a very close call for our staff, but we made the recommendation not to list at this time. In June of 2022, the Fish and Game Commission considered the status review. Public comments were taken at this meeting as well. After two votes, one to list and one to not list, the Fish and Game Commission was not able to agree on a listing status. At this meeting, the decision was continued to a future meeting and the record was held open to receive additional comments from tribal partners. Subsequently, the species remains a candidate under CESA to this day. In February of 2023, the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act was introduced in the California legislature in a budget trailer bill, and it contained the original language of the act. This language protects the species, but offers a path forward for economic development. Importantly, the act also requires CDFW to collaborate with California Native American tribes to develop and implement a Western Joshua Tree conservation plan. In July, Trailer Bill SB 122 passed and was signed by the governor. There were some substantial changes from the original language of the act, but the intent was the same. And here we are. The Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act protects the trees with CESA-like conditions. However, it offers different options for management and conservation of the species. It creates two permitting systems, one for dealing with hazard trees and one for the incidental take of trees. Incidental take permits will be covered later, but it is important to note that the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act creates a set of fees to remove and impact trees. Those fees go into the conservation fund, 
which purpose is to conserve the species through land acquisitions and conservation easements and high quality Western Joshua tree habitat. It can also fund the enhancement, restoration, management, and monitoring of Western Joshua tree habitat. The Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act also requires CDFW to create a conservation plan with the input of agencies, California tribal entities, and the public all by December of 2024. One of the last things that the Western Joshua Tree does is it requires the Fish and Game Commission to reconsider listing under the California Endangered Species Act in 2033. So in a sense, this puts their decision on hold unless they deem the conservation plan and the actions are not doing enough to conserve the species and they decide that it needs the full protections of CESA. And with that, we're gonna talk about the permitting systems created by the Act. The two main permitting systems created by the Act are the Hazard Management Permit System and the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act Incidental Take Permit System. There are also several other permits that can be obtained to manage Joshua trees, and these are CESA Incidental Take Permits, Natural Community Conservation Plans, Safe Harbor Agreements, Voluntary Local Programs, and Memoranda of Understanding. We will not go over all of these permits, but instead we'll focus on the permits that may be of most use to you and your fellow tribal members. The purpose of the hazard management permit system is to create a streamlined legal mechanism to trim or remove dead trees or trim live trees that are a hazard to human health and safety. Please note there is no option for removing live trees under this permitting system. To qualify for one of these permits, trees or limbs must meet at least one of the following conditions. They have fallen over and are within 30 feet of a structure, they are leaning against an existing structure, or they are creating an imminent threat to human health and safety. The Act also requires a desert native plant specialist in certain situations. Desert native plant specialists are defined in the Act as someone who is an arborist certified by the International Society of Arboriculture or an individual with at least five years of professional experience in relocating or restoring native California desert vegetation. Desert native plant specialists are needed to trim live Joshua trees under this permitting system. However, detached limbs and trees may be removed by the property owner. We won't go over the application process in detail, but you should know that these permits are available now and they're on our website, along with a good set of instructions and guides on what types of information we will need to process applications. Now, we're gonna go over the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Act incidental take permits. In order to get a take permit, the permittee must meet certain conditions. The first is that the permittee must submit a census of all Western Joshua trees within the project area, regardless if they are being taken or not. The census must include photographs of each tree and their size according to three categories, less than one meter, one meter or greater, but less than five meters, or five meters or greater. The census will ask for some additional information like whether the tree is producing flowers or fruits, whether the tree is alive or dead, if there is a plan to relocate the tree and where. It is important to note here that anyone can conduct the census, meaning they do not have to be a desert native plant specialist. They just need to be able to accurately find and record Western Joshua trees in their project area. The second condition is that permittees must avoid and minimize impacts to Western Joshua trees to the greatest extent practicable. 
Together with California Native American tribes, CDFW would like to develop these measures in ways to protect or reduce harm to individual trees and habitat. These measures can be incorporated into incidental take permits on a project by project basis. Factors affecting which measures are required will depend on the level of impact. Are we talking about a tree or two in someone's backyard or a few hundred trees? Some examples may include establishing buffers around trees based on different life stages, setting up individual protections around trees within the project area, making seed collections, protecting exposed soil around Joshua trees from erosion during storm events, taking actions to limit invasive pests, limiting herbicide or insecticide use, or in some cases, projects may be asked to modify their design to reduce impacts to trees. CDFW can also require that a permittee relocate trees according to guidelines that can be co-developed with California Native American tribes. The permittee would be required to implement measures to assist the survival of trees. This could include watering and monitoring the health of the relocated tree for a certain length of time afterwards. Lastly, the Act says that the permittee must mitigate all impacts to and taking of Western Joshua trees, which, for the purposes of the Act, will include paying fees based on their size. And as mentioned before, these fees will go into the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Fund, which we will go over in a bit. Here are a few permits that might be of use to you and your fellow tribal members. The Act allows for CDFW to enter into memoranda of understanding with California Native American tribes to allow tribes to use and possess Western Joshua trees for continuing traditional practices. We also wanted to bring up a few provisions in the Act regarding relocated trees that might be of interest to you. First, the Act directs CDFW to provide for the relocation of Western Joshua trees to tribal land upon request from a tribe. So, if you have land somewhere and you would like to have trees relocated there, we can work with you to make that happen. Some things to consider when requesting relocated trees might be whether your land is within future suitable habitat for the tree. However, anywhere within current habitat or even marginal habitat would be acceptable. Furthermore, the permittee, not the tribe, will be responsible to implement measures to assist in the survival of relocated Joshua trees. This will include watering and monitoring for a certain length of time after the trees are relocated. However, if the landowner would prefer to maintain relocated Joshua trees themselves, I'm sure we can work something out. Okay, so we mentioned the fees from the incidental take permits go into the Western Joshua Tree Conservation Fund. We're now gonna briefly talk about what those funds will be used for. The purpose of the fund will be to acquire, conserve, and manage Western Joshua Tree conservation lands and completing other activities to conserve the species. The Act identifies some suggested uses of the fund. Besides land acquisitions, the fund can be used for establish, establishing conservation easements, monitoring, restoration, transaction costs, and funding endowments for land management. The conservation fund will be the main source of funding to carry out conservation activities described in the conservation plan. The conservation plan will provide a framework for how conservation activities will be implemented. We welcome and look forward to California Native American collaboration as we prepare the conservation plan in 2023 and 2024. The Act requires CDFW to develop and implement a conservation plan in collaboration with the Fish and Game Commission, government agencies, California Native American tribes, and the public. 
the act defines some of the things that need to be included in the conservation plan. This includes actions we must take to conserve the species and ways to tell if our actions are working or not. It must include ways for people to avoid or reduce their impacts to Joshua trees. The plan needs to have good guidance on how to handle and care for relocated Joshua trees. It also needs the input of California Native American tribes on how to do this. We believe that the conservation plan will be stronger and more effective at conserving the Western Joshua tree with partnership from Native American tribes. The sharing of traditional ecological knowledge related to the tree paired with trad traditional land stewardship practices would help ensure the tree's survival. We recognize that there is a vast body of tribal knowledge and traditional practices related to the Western Joshua tree and invite interested California Native American tribes to contact us. Co-management of the Joshua tree may mean formal consultation or informal collaboration. We can establish MOUs to practice traditional ways of caring for the Western Joshua tree and its habitat, or we can provide funding or endowments to help tribes carry out conservation activities. The picture on your right shows land that was recently purchased by CDFW and transferred to the Native American Land Conservancy. This land has great importance to local tribes of the Kern Valley. This serves as an example of a mutually beneficial co-management partnership that we are interested in exploring throughout the range of Western Joshua Tree. And on that note, we just want to point out that the timeline to get the input into the conservation plan is incredibly short. The entire plan must be finished by December of 2024, meaning we have little over a year to get everything in place. There will be opportunity to amend the plan in the future, but this first draft will serve as the framework for Western Joshua Tree conservation. There will be a live question and answer session that will be held online on December 14th. Questions can be submitted ahead of time through the registration form, which we will provide at the end of this presentation. You may also submit questions through the Q&A chat box during the event. We will do our best to answer those questions during the webinar. However, please note that we may need some time afterwards to get you the most accurate answer. We will be sending out letters soon to tribal contacts to ask if they are interested in participating in the plan's development. Once we have a list of participating tribes, we will send out a facilitator to each tribe to meet internally and confidentially to talk about co-management activities and traditional ecological knowledge to help conserve the species. After, CDFW will meet individually with each participating tribe to begin discussions of co-management. So there are a few ways you can register for the webinar on December 14th. You can use a smartphone to scan this QR code to take you to the registration form. You can also find a link on our conservation plan website at the address displayed at the bottom of the screen. You can email wjt at wildlife dot ca dot gov with a request to be registered or you can call 916-224-6469 to speak with a live person who can register you. Once registered you will receive a link approximately one week before the event which can be joined through a web browser. If your tribe is interested now in participating in the conservation plan's development, please email tribal.liaison at wildlife.ca.gov. Thank you for watching this video, and we look forward to working with you soon.